Hello, my name is Samantha, and today I will explore microphone types, patterns, and frequency responses so that you can easily choose the best microphone for your needs, and why you should even care in the first place. So first I think I'll start by showing you a quick comparison to demonstrate why you actually need a professional microphone for your projects. Here at my home, I have an iPhone, a MacBook, and a real microphone set up, so let's take a listen to hear the differences. Okay, so here I have my MacBook, iPhone, and microphone recordings all in Pro Tools, all recorded from the same environment. Let's just dive in. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. I'll even bring this up a little. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Right, okay, so it's definitely done something a little odd to my voice here. Let's try the iPhone. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Okay, I'll bring this up too. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. It's a little better, a lot noisier, and I'd say it's still a little artificial sounding. Now here's the real microphone. I used an MHK60, which I'll show off later. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. That sounds a lot better to me. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Let's try one last thing and listen to them side by side. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Right, so overall the iPhone was definitely a lot closer to my real voice than the MacBook, but the quality of either of those just couldn't come near the quality of the 60. Using a professional microphone for your projects helps you a lot with your post-production work and really just hires the production value of your project. So with that, let's jump into understanding professional mics better. Now, what type of professional microphones are available? There are several different types of microphones, but today I will be focusing on the difference between dynamic and condenser mics. When sound waves pass into a dynamic microphone, they hit a diaphragm. This diaphragm moves and bends as it is affected by the noise. This information is picked up by a small coil wrapped around the magnet in the inside of the microphone that then converts this analog signal into an electric one. This system allows dynamic microphones to be generally more durable than condenser microphones and can take more accidental hits and louder noises while also being less expensive. In condenser microphones, however, the diaphragm passes the signal to a small metal plate. This plate gets powered by either batteries or phantom power to convert the signal to a digital format. Because of this, condensers tend to be a bit more concise and natural sounding than a dynamic microphone, but also more fragile and expensive. The next important thing to know when choosing a microphone is its pattern. A pattern chart shows how sensitive a microphone can be, with 0 to 25 decibels relating to the microphone's output represented by rings, and what direction the microphone receives signal from, with 0 being directly in front of the mic. An omnidirectional microphone, for instance, records audio from every direction, which can commonly be seen in lavalier microphones. Bidirectional mics pick up audio equally from both in front and behind the microphone, which could be good for interviews. There are a couple different types of unidirectional microphones. Firstly, a basic cardioid mic has a classic pattern with a wide range that records what's in front of it. A hypercardioid mic picks up in front and also the room behind, meaning it will pick up any extra reverb not directly in front of the mic. And a super cardioid mic picks up a more direct range for both in front and behind. Then by far the most directional. A low bar microphone has a large learning curve to use well with an interesting pattern and can only exist as a shotgun microphone. The term shotgun is often used while talking about mics and may have led to some ambiguity. Shotgun microphones can either be condenser or dynamic and can be paired with a few different patterns. The identifying factor for a shotgun microphone is a built-in tube on the front end of the microphone that has tiny holes or slits. Because of these slits, the tube can phase out sounds coming from the rear or sides of the microphone. And the longer the tube, the wider range that gets phased out, and therefore the more directional it becomes. So you'll typically see this sort of thing with hyper and super cardioid microphones or low bar ones. The last piece of information that's useful when looking into mics are frequency response charts. 
When made, microphones get tested to understand exactly how they react to a full range of frequencies. The mics get placed in a completely dead chamber and then get exposed to pink noise being played. As the microphone picks up the noise, its signal gets routed to an analyzer that shows the microphone's output as data and a frequency response chart. With this chart, you can tell exactly how a microphone handles different frequencies. So, how do you read one? Here, the x-axis equals the frequencies tested, and the y-axis equals the microphone's output in decibels. Here's what a normal graph might look like. You might sometimes find microphones with a bump in this line of the graph, meaning that the microphone gives out extra output at those frequencies. The opposite goes for drop-offs around the lower region, which can be quite common. So generally, you want the line to be as flat on zero as possible, offering the most natural sound. How about we take a look at our own examples? I took it upon myself to test our professional microphones to show off exactly how they'll work compared to the brand's own specs and other research. The MHK416 has been considered very standard on and off set for sound effects for years. It is condenser, super cardioid, and a little heavier than the other MHK models I'm looking at today. With that, here are some of my tests. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. has the tube interference making it a shotgun mic, and the frequency response range is 40 to 20k hertz, obviously with a slight bump in response toward the higher end of the spectrum. The MHK60 is a condenser, super cardioid microphone with tube interference similar to but more direct than the 416, making it another shotgun mic. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The frequency response range is 50 to 20k hertz, so it actually captures slightly less of the lower range of frequency, but tends to be more flat overall than the 416, giving you a slightly more consistent or natural sound. The MHK70 is considered very standard for dialogue. It is a condenser, super cardioid microphone with tube interference that is longer than the 60. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The frequency response range is 50 to 20k hertz, so it's the same range as the 60, but because of the extra length, its pattern is a bit more directional. The MHK40 is our last condenser microphone for today. It is a cardioid mic that Sennheiser says is good for a large number of applications. 
The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The frequency response range is 40 to 20 kHz and seems really flat in the response overall, which is great. Finally, the Sennheiser EW100 ENG G3 lavalier microphones. Lavalier microphones are small enough to get placed by someone's collar or even underneath their clothing to record audio. This specific model is wireless, meaning that this microphone gets connected to a pack the actor or broadcaster wears, and then the signal gets transmitted to receivers to be recorded somewhere else. These types of mics can be invisible underneath actors' clothing and are definitely essential in any production mixer's toolkit for dialogue, especially if the boom isn't quite cutting it. Now I'll put my test side by side so that you can just have a quick comparison. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Based off of my research and my tests, hopefully you can see why different microphones would be better for different jobs. With what you know now about frequency responses and patterns, consider the MHK416, 60, or 40 for Foley sound effects and field recordings, depending on how directional you're looking for the sample to be, and stick with more directional mics like the MHK60 or 70 when recording dialogue, and definitely also always bring lav mics to set with you. Good luck, and thanks for watching. As a bonus, here are a couple films from the recent past and some of the professional microphones they used. Jesus. Look at this. It's massive. I built all this. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, stay. What's your name? Andrew Naiman, sir. What year are you? I'm a uh, first year. You know who I am? Yes, sir. So you know I'm looking for players? Yes, sir. Then why did you stop playing? 